Okay, so welcome to week one, lecture two uh, of fluid mechanics. So today we will start a bit, start uh, slow and start uh, building on the basics. Right. So uh, what we're going to talk today is basically build up the mathematical preliminaries and definitions uh, of various quantities um, required to set up the fluid dynamics uh, equations right and also discuss about some other basically the build on the foundations with which we can start discussing uh, the quantities uh, about the equations of uh, mass momentum energy um, conservation of mass momentum energy so just to start uh, the beginning fluid mechanics is of course about the uh, flow of uh, fluid element uh, element of the fluid where its uh, velocity field is described as a function of r and t space and time uh, and th what the velocity field will be uh, that can be solved using the fluid dynamics equations and also one has one can specify the pressure uh, or the force fields which is a function of uh, r and t or the boundaries uh, and also calculate in terms of uh, say the density if the density of the fluid varies as a function of r and t so you specify some of the quantities and um, calculate or measure rest of the if you're doing an experiment then you measure uh, uh, rest of the other variables right uh, note when we say vrt pressure rt we are referring to a very small fluid element uh, and thereby we are looking at the velocity field of that fluid element uh, as it uh, as the velocity field or the pressure field or the density field uh, varies as a function of r and t over all space and time but this small fluid element and sometimes i might even refer to it as a fluid particle that actually contains an extremely large number of atoms and molecules so basically we are talking of fluid in the continuum limit so a small fluid element or a small fluid particle has a large number of particles inside that element which are undergoing uh, collisions uh, and locally they are in uh, thermal equilibrium so that you can define for that fluid element an average density or an average velocity field or a pressure field or you can uh, define suppose the temperature of the fluid element the temperature is of course a statistical quantity but you can define it uh, for a large number of particles the local temperature and temperature can vary over so each element of the fluid is in uh, local thermal equilibrium that's uh, that's the idea right uh, the pressure pressure also is a uh, I mean, one can look at it, uh, uh, it is a macroscopic uh, quantity which you measure, you feel the pressure of air or whatever. And it's a consequence uh, of uh, momentum transfer. Uh, so on wherever you are feeling the pressure, so there is essentially momentum transfer by a large number of atoms and molecules due to molecular collisions. And the net effect due to multiple collisions averaged over a large amount of time is what you feel as pressure right so we are not in the fluid mechanics course we are not in the microscopic uh, description of uh, uh, collisions and so on and so forth uh, and we are in the continuum description and basically that means that the fluid element whatever we choose has to be large what does it mean to say large uh, because this word large uh, relative to what? So relative to mean free path, suppose, of uh, the molecules. Now in air, uh, the mean free path of uh, air molecules are approximately 5 into 10 to the power minus 8 meters or if you like uh, 500 uh, angstroms approximately, right? Uh, that's right. So 500 angstroms approximately, right? And then your volume element uh, should contain, uh, uh, be much larger than the mean free path whole cube. I mean, 
ma managing the dimensions um, since we are talking of volume element hence lambda cube right so you can talk you you can talk about a uh, fluid uh, fluid element or fluid particle which is about 1 micron in size or 5 microns in size so you have a fluid element which is resolved at the 5 micron or 1 micron length scale so that within a fluid element there are large number of molecules which are undergoing collisions uh, and undercoats locally thermalizing the system right and so the quantity that we use um, which comes useful to figure out uh, you know, what is the what is the whether we can use a fluid mechanical fluid dynamics description as being taught in the course is the so-called Knudsen number and that is a ratio of the mean free path of the uh, corresponding fluid atoms and molecules and on the denominator one uh, has a characteristic length scale of flow so um, so suppose uh, you have extremely dilute gas absolutely vacuum uh, right and you have a nano channel so suppose this channel l is order of uh, so suppose 10 10 nanometers right there. Right. Then the and it's a vacuum. So basically, these particles are colliding with the walls before they can collide with themselves. Uh, right. So you have essentially a very large Knudsen number because the mean free path is much larger uh, or equivalent in scale to the length scale. Uh, we, uh, here the length scale is the distance between the walls and so here you cannot talk about a fluid element and you cannot talk about a fluid velocity field uh, which you uh, described by the Newton's equation of I mean the, 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 the continuum description it is not valid or suppose you have a large number of molecules right here in a volume dv uh, so here they would be undergoing collisions and here the length scale of flow would be suppose there's some sphere over which some fluid is flowing and then it would be L. And then uh, basically here the Newton number would be much, much smaller than one. And you can have a continuum description of the fluid. But if however the number of particles or the mean free path was comparable to this dimension, then this continuum description will fail. Right uh, now, if as uh, compared to an air, so in air, basically you have a you have a mean free path of five into ten to minus eight meters, so it's five hundred angstroms. But uh, for a liquid, you have a much smaller mean free path, right? Maybe five angstroms or even less, um, right? So there you can wa work with a fluid element which is much smaller so maybe you can uh, work with a fluid element uh, which is uh, as low as 5 nanometers or 10 nanometers because within a fluid element nanometer whole cube if you're talking about a volume then you would have enough molecules and uh, there would be uh, collisions and so on and so forth and actually uh, in some cases of nanofluidics uh, often the continuum uh, description is valid and that's not surprising because because you're looking at low Knudsen numbers, right? So in air, your dV uh, will be, uh, your fluid element will be around dx cube. The minimum value that you can take will be dx cube with dx equal to around one micron. Uh, in water, you could take dx to be around five or 10 nanometers, I guess, where the, where the continuum description is, is still valid. But in space, where lambda could be meters or more, uh, then you have to take your volume element or the minimal size of fluid element, uh, delta x cube with delta x equal to 10 kilometers or even more maybe. And even uh, the time that you can look at when you discretize time and look at the minimum time where the fluid description. Just one second. No, what's wrong? And uh, even the time, uh, we have to take it suitably so that the fluid mechanical uh, um, 
description is valid. So an extremely important number um, is the Knudsen number, and it's of course a um, dimensionless quantity. Right. So for continuum hypothesis, Knudsen number should be smaller than 0 0.1. And uh, if Knudsen number is between 0 0.001 and 0 0.1, yes, continuum hypothesis will still be valid. But uh, then one has to be careful about the uh, boundary conditions of the walls and so on and so forth. They are going to be slightly different from the standard ones. Uh, that we use for, uh, suppose, uh, large scale uh, flows or engineering flows and so on and so forth. So you have to have slip boundary conditions. One has to be careful if you adapt the boundary conditions. Uh, and we'll come to this much later. Okay. Now, uh, now uh, when you have your fluid dynamics, uh, we will be typically talking about uh, transport of mass, momentum, and, and energy. And each of these quantities can basically flow. Uh, they can, mass can flow. Suppose this volume uh, element can move from this region in space across this surface area to this, the, to here. And thereby you have a mass flux. Flux means where basically you have a mass current, right? Mass, uh, there's a direction, there's a change in the direction. Um, so there's a current. Current means mass is moving from here to here. And flux means uh, this current vector, J vector dot dA. And you can calculate how much mass is flowing across the surface per unit area, per unit time, which will give you the flux. If you like. Right? So that is a flow. Uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, where instead of one element of uh, fluid moving across, you can ha also have collisional transport, collisional transport uh, of mass. So basically, in that case, uh, suppose uh, suppose you have a background background fluid. Um, maybe air and you have at some region higher density and at some other area lower density and the density uh, difference is not too high. So the, there could also be mass transport. So the, this is the mass current and it could also diffuse from one region to the other. So you can have not only diffusion of Brownian particles in a background fluid, but you could also have under small density gradients, a small uh, pressure gradients, I mean, very little, relatively lesser pressure gradients, you could have also diffusive transport of mass uh, from one region to the other. And then you would write down the fixed law, which says the current is proportional to minus d, the diffusion constant, the gradient, right? And in some cases, in some cases, this, this will be more important in some other cases, in some other set of conditions, this would be more important, right? I mean, and the most general equation will have both this and this. But under certain uh, cases, you can maybe neglect this, and in some other cases, you can neglect this. And similarly, you can have momentum flow, where suppose a fluid element of uh, volume dv1 and uh, velocity v1 vector uh, basically the momentum is transported this since this has velocity v1 vector this moves from here to here and thereby this momentum is transported across the surface from here to here right and similarly you could have a different volume element dv2 with velocity v2 and this entire uh, fluid element moves from here to here so they, they, this is, and, and since this moves, they can also basically collide with each other and transform momentum and so on and so forth, apply force. So this is momentum transport by flow. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, what one could also have is so-called uh, momentum transport by diffusion. Momentum transport by diffusion, uh, suppose this is a volume element dv1. Uh, which is moving in this direction, uh, velocity v2. And here uh, you have velocity 
you have another uh, volume element uh, dv2 which is moving with velocity v1 and both are moving in this direction right so it's basically shear flow you have various fluid elements moving in straight lines then by virtue of collision bit or uh, between this layer of particles and this layer of particles uh, you will also have momentum diffusion you can have momentum flow as described here or momentum diffusion right so here basically the current depends upon so when you had mass diffusion the current depends upon the density gradient all right here i have not intentionally written down a similar equation uh, because it's a bit more complicated and you'll wait two three classes before we talk about uh, momentum diffusion and when it is valid but i have written down the diffusion constant for momentum diffusion and that actually depends as you'll see later is the ratio of the viscosity of the fluid divided by density of the fluid which is called kinematic viscosity and is and is denoted by the symbol nu right uh, so 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 what i want to say that direct flow is sometimes important to transport mass momentum and energy from one point to the other on the other hand through a fluid you could also have mass diffusion or momentum diffusion or energy diffusion right and uh, typically these come with uh, the current comes with a minus sign uh, and because that's more of a convention because basically the currents uh, point opposite to the direction of the gradient and remember the gradient is the direction of the fastest increase so if the density is increasing uh, from suppose x1 to x2 then the current will flow from x2 to x1 right and similarly you can talk about the energy also so you have an element of uh, fluid suppose at temperature t2 and that flows across a uh, surface area to occupy um, this volume at a different point in space and time and thereby the energy which was there in this volume element is transported from here to here and here uh, you have another volume uh, element dv with at temperature t1 which is supposed transported from here to here and of course after that there can be mixing and so on and so forth the uh, the motion uh, will of course affect because there will be energy exchange uh, but what you, you could also have in a certain uh, different scenario uh, is basically energy diffusion in which case suppose that uh, both both these fluid elements are moving parallel to each other with velocity v1 say so both are moving with velocity v1 right but one is at a temperature t2 and the other is at a temperature t1 and through the fluid you could also have uh, energy current minus k grad t and here you are really looking at thermal conductivity kappa is thermal conductivity and depending upon the gradient of temperature there can be energy diffusion through collisions through collisions of the fluid uh, and there can be a heat flux again right so it's basically amount of energy uh, passing through a unit area per unit time that would be basically the uh, heat flux right and uh, these fixed law and fourier's law are basically phenomenological laws and the point is the diffusion tries to decrease gradients and in some cases we'll be looking at such a phenomena and in other cases for the fluid uh, you can have uh, heat transport by diffusion instead of by flow as well and these are different mechanisms so, so all these things appear in the big equation of the conservation but one has to be aware which which mechanism is dominant in various kinds of flows and we will consider them uh, separately but of course sometimes both happen in parallel right so this was the background um, i wanted to give okay just an idea about the units of diffusion constant 
so basically mass current is uh, amount of mass being transported per unit area per unit time uh, uh, so that that is ml squared t and then grad of n which is concentration right concentration is mass by l cube mm. yeah uh, i don't know where did the m go there has to be an m here also right as so m by l cube so that you will see that the so that the uh, so that the units the units of diffusion constant uh, for momentum diffusion is l square uh, mass diffusion is l square by t and here uh, one can write uh, for the momentum diffusion uh, one can write the stress which is force per unit area uh, to be equal to the viscosity into gamma dot and uh, right and uh, you can actually so you can get the dimensions of viscosity here right uh, so viscosity has dimensions of m by tl by solving this but the diffusion constant which is kinematic viscosity is actually uh, eta by rho right so here what i have done is the dimensions of viscosity and here i have added dimensions of rho here uh, mass m is missing one should be have m just like here m by l cube and then again one gets uh, dimensions of l square by t right and if you have energy diffusion uh, then uh, the energy the, the 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 here what i have done is basically write down uh, figure out the dimensions of j and which is m square uh, l square by t square which is dimensions of energy by l square per unit area per unit time and you get this dimension and thereby if you have that you can calculate the dimensions of uh, conductivity um, right thermal conductivity and then if you put this so basically you have g which is m by t cube and then gradient one by l which goes in the numerator and then you have dimensions of temperature theta uh, so this is the dimensions of conductivity right and if you just rearrange terms a bit ml square by t square that would be dimensions of uh, yeah energy per unit time so you can also have watt per meter kelvin so you can just work it out right uh, okay uh, a bit of thermodynamics as i told you the first two classes are going to be a bit of the background so basically each element of the fluid has potential energy and kinetic energy uh, which creates the internal energy of the system uh, fluid can transport heat uh, what is heat? It is essentially the thermal energy uh, or the internal energy being transferred through the boundaries. So, is, uh, so energy in transport is heat through, suppose, an area delta A. And work is energy transfer, not internal energy, not thermal energy or internal energy is transfer, but anyway, energy transfer at the boundaries. And that depends upon F dot DX or work done depends on P dot DV and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and of course, heat is, can be, is often represented as D cross Q. Other than that, we will be talking about enthalpy at times. What is enthalpy? It is the internal energy plus P pressure into volume and taking the derivative of U, the internal energy uh, with time, the rate of change of internal energy with time at constant volume gives the CV, which is the heat capacity at constant volume. On the other hand, you can also have heat capacity at constant pressure, and this will be used later, which will be del H rate of change of enthalpy with temperature at constant 
pressure right furthermore one can write down the tds T, tds is equal to dq but uh, i mean it's it's uh, it's identified with heat transfer only valve in a reversible process and that is equal to du plus pdv and tds can also be written as dh in terms of a d enthalpy minus pdp but remember these are state functions and dependent only on the initial and the final uh, states right so these are all made up of state functions okay the other concepts that we shall be needing uh, is we have to discuss uh, stress ray, uh, stress and strain and so on and so forth and their tensor quantities so we shall start right from the beginning and define for you what is a vector a so what is a vector a any quantity whose components whose three suppose uh, you have a quant uh, quantity a uh, and it uh, it is described by a combination of three numbers but those three numbers uh, whose components have to transform uh, like the components of the position vector r under rotation of the coordinate system if uh, a quantity has this property you call that a vector so there are certain ways that a position vector uh, transforms under rotation of the coordinate system and if your uh, quantity of interest has the same property then you call that a vector right in general suppose you have uh, so how does the position vector transform suppose x dash right uh, a combination of three numbers x1 x2 x3 x y z if you like dash and under a coordinate transformation uh, suppose one has to uh, the coordinate transformation is carried out by the rotation matrix with a double dash note so vectors are noted by single dash on top and uh, tensors or matrices tensors by double dash so basically if you have a row matrix the, then x1 x2 x3 in terms of the new coordinate system will be written like this and this is the basically rotation matrix if you like right and uh, so then x1 dash x1 dash will be uh, x1 into c11 x2 into c21 x3 into c31 right now if we decided to write this if we decided to write this as a uh, column vector then this rotation matrix and i've written it only taken only the two by two matrix of course in general it can be three then it has to be the transpose and x1 x2 why uh, because suppose there are two matrices r1 r2 transpose is r2 transpose and r1 transpose right so basically you're transposing this so c c11 c one two is here and c two one is here and so on and so forth and x one and x two right and if you write it like this you can again check that you are getting the right numbers of course i've dropped i've not written the third term now this this uh, or this can be written as x dash i the coordinate the ith coordinate like one is i into xk cki now the thing to note is on the right hand side of the equation there are repeated indexes kk and that actually means a double summation this is the so called einstein convention you must have already come across uh, this convention in the first two or three years but i'm just repeating it for the sake of uh, completeness but note x1 right so x i and then you have to keep on multiplying x1 note the second index is unchanged when you are multiplying right it's only that the first index one two three is changing right x1 to c11 
x2 into c21 and so you have to be careful to write this at xk the first index is g there's a sum over the first index and the second index remains unchanged i i'm going to stick to this convention and this i and is the same as this i whereas the k is not there in this side of the equation because it is implied that repeated indices repeated index there's a sum over it right so there's, this is something to keep in mind uh, what would be the rotation uh, matrix uh, explicitly in two dimensions it is cos theta sin theta minus sin theta and cos theta and when you take a transpose of it this column becomes this row right and you can of course check that c into c transpose the rotation matrix into the rotation matrix transpose is nothing but what what does that mean the basically given a rotation and then taking it back and that is equal to one this is the unit matrix right uh, now suppose so this was about writing uh, x dash in terms of x1 x2 and x3 where you are multiplying it now suppose you wanted to write x1 x2 x3 in terms of this right so then what you would do is write x1 x2 in terms of x1 dash x2 dash and how would you do that you have to give it an opposite rotation you have to give a rotation of minus theta so you're going back so you're transforming coordinates uh, back so that you can write x1 x1 x2 in terms of x1 dash x2 dash so again you are doing a giving a coordinate transformation rotation back matrix except that now theta dash equal to minus theta right so rotate x dash back by theta dash equal to minus theta so that you will get back here x1 and x2 right and if you do that so if you put that you would see that what you have so when you put your minus theta what you have is you have to basically multiply this by the rotation matrix transpose so it's c transpose that's all that you get right so in in this einstein notation if you have xi if you're writing xi in terms of x dash k remember you have to transpose this so that this equation now will become it was ki previously now it is ik right you have to be careful about that um, and uh, yeah so 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 here it is in the second it is in the second uh, index so just notice that okay so but we uh, so for vector i mean this vector discussion was primarily uh, to start discussing about tensors of rank two. And why should we need tensors? Because we will have quantities like the stress and the strain, which are essentially tensors, right? And just to talk about the stress tensor, it's a stress tensor. Uh, what you do is if you have a fluid element, you first fix your coordinate system, then, then decide upon a surface area you have to decide upon a surface area, uh, identify area DAI, okay? And on that area, surface area of the fluid element, you basically specify what is the direction of force on it. Uh, remember, you can have shear forces. So if the fluid element is suppose in the x direction, you could have a force acting on the y direction or z direction or some arbitrary direction, uh, one component of which could be x and another component of which could be in the y direction. So in that sense, the sigma xy, uh, the first element is identification of the area element. You typically specify an area element by a unique normal to the surface area. Right, so dAx, if you like, and sigma xy, uh, the force acting in the y direction. Of course, you could have also sigma xx, which in which case the force acts in the same direction as this. So that would be the normal components or the diagonal components. 
right? So in general, the stress tensor in this course will be denoted by sigma double line, or since I'll be uh, referring to multiple, more than one book, uh, in some books, it uses the symbol tau. Uh, and there has to be a, another line here, double line. Here. Yeah. So this is a stress tensor. So this or this, I missed out a line. So sigma 1,1, one, one, so in general, it can be written as 1,1, one, 1,2, one, one, 1,3, one, and so on and so forth. So it's a second order tensor, basically. Right? Uh, so now, just what is a tensor? I mean, just a collection of nine numbers is not a tensor. But suppose you have some quantity sigma ij, in, in our case, the stress tensor, and it follows a particular transformation rule, right? Where uh, if you have rotated the axis, then sigma dash mn follows rotation matrix elements, rotation matrix elements into sigma ij, where i and j note are repeated indices and thereby. Uh, it automatically means that there's a double summation on it. And note that here there is m and n on the left-hand side of the equation, and the m and n appear only once in this, uh, uh, on, on the right-hand side of the equation. So, so there's a summation over i, there's a summation over j, but no summation over m and n. Right. So basically, in general, sigma dash, x dash, y dash, can also be written in rotated coordinates in terms of f y dash, right? In uh, so the value of force or the components of force in the rotated coordinates, and the area element in rotated coordinates, and so on and so forth. And this double summation can be accurately expressed if sigma dash m n, writing it in tensor notation, this is the rotation matrix C transpose MI. This is the stress tensor in the original uh, original axis. And this is, again, the rotation matrix, right? So if you write it in 2D, uh, I have written it down. Um, so, if it's, um, so sigma I have written in terms of S because there are too many things to write. And this was C11, C12, C21, C22. But note that C11 and C. Oh, OK, OK. So here I have said, OK, I have to transpose it. Yeah, so the same matrix is written here, the transpose. And by here, I have transposed it actually. C11 and C12 appears here. Uh, and I've just checked out that uh, in the next page, uh, so I'm not going to read this because I'm going to get boring, but you should check it out uh, that you are getting the right summation here. And note that sigma, when you had sigma dash suppose 1, 1, right? So those two indices were always intact. Uh, on the right-hand side of the equation, you can see 1, 1, and you have C here 1 and this 1, here 1, and uh, yeah. So this one and this one, this one and this one, and so on and so forth. You can check for yourself, right? And also notice that these are these are appearing as the second index in C, uh, IM and CJN, right? So just check it out for yourself. Uh, and well, uh, just as we discussed, I think sigma xy is fi into dax on the other hand you can have also sigma yz and that would be basically force in the z direction it's in the z direction uh acting on area element in the y direction right so that would be that would be your sigma yz and similarly you could have the sigma zx in which you figure out your area element where which is normal the normal to the area element is in the z direction. So d a z and then uh, force is acting in the x direction. See where this is z, this is y, and this is x direction, right? So similarly, a strain. Uh, so this is what 
the stress. Um, yeah, stress sensor is defined. Uh, the other things which we might use is the chronic delta, where delta ij, the chronic delta tensor, delta ij equal to 1 uh, when i equal to j, and delta ij equal to 0 when i not equal to j. And of course, you have only the diagonal terms here. Uh, you have also the so-called epsilon, the symbol epsilon, which is used to uh, to write in short uh, tensor tensors, especially when you have cross products, so that A cross B into I is epsilon I J K into A J. So the ith component, that's the first one here, I and A J and B K, right? So you have a summation over uh, J and K. And what is epsilon IJK? I'm sure you would have seen this again once uh, before, but epsilon IJK equal to one if I, J and K, suppose call them one, two or three, they appear in the clockwise direction. So if you put three to be here, like three, one, two, or, uh, or suppose, so, 3, 1, 2, and then we'll bring back to here in the clockwise direction, 2, 3, 1, then epsilon ijk equal to 1. Now, if this is anticyclic, if this one, this ijk appeared in anticyclic order, such that ijk equal to 1, 3, 2, right? So, 3, 2, 1, or 2, 1, 3, then the value of this is minus 1. And uh, if there are repeated indices in epsilon, this is called the Levi Civita symbol, uh, then basically this is equal to zero. So I I equal to zero and so on and so forth, right? And we often use this to write down, so like A cross B Y is epsilon, uh, ax into bz and it will give you the right uh, sign also right so uh, the other relation which might come much later in the course is just the mathematical pre preliminaries is epsilon ijk uh, is uh, the product of these two levi civita symbols where you notice that i is repeated and here you have JK and here you have MN, uh, then note that this can be written in terms of J, M, K, N. So second, second, J, M, third, third, K, N, minus delta J, N. So second, third, and M, K. Uh, third, second, and so on and so forth. Thus, choose uh, choose uh, the value of i j k and i m n and see whether you get the uh, do a product on the right hand side. So suppose it will be this will be sometimes one and this will be sometimes minus one. And if you expand it and if you write it down, I mean like use these symbols, these values, you'll see that this relationship. Course. Just try it out for yourself. Okay. Uh, okay. That's the mathematical preliminary. Uh, now we will start talking about the physics, but let me record that in the next set.